the National Museum of Ireland Country Life has a very large basket collection and over 30 baskets are on display and I think, um, I think it's really interesting that baskets were used in every aspect of life. The baskets that we have um, in the collection are mostly made by people for their own use or for their neighbours but we do also have professional basket makers um, such as the Shanahans of Tipperary who were well-known professional basket makers over three generations um, and we have an example of their herring cran um, in, on display. But um, I suppose the baskets that we mostly have on display from the, the local makers for their own use, they, um, they were going out of, out of use really post-war, the 1950s, post-World War II. 1950s when you saw the, um, the beginnings of cardboard replacing them and then in the 1960s, 70s and 80s plastic. So um, as such they're the last of the traditional basket makers, what, what people might say um, taught by generation to generation from knee to knee um, over many generations. So I think one basket maker that is very interesting, I suppose he gives us a feel of what it's all about was uh, Sean O'Curran, who's actually from Galway, <laughs> but uh, he, he was filmed by the museum in the 1960s when he was 80, but he'd been making baskets since uh, 1900, but he'd been taught by his father. Um, so very quickly, you go back hundreds of years um, in basket making. And I suppose he, his is a good example because um, we know he had his Sally Garden um, that he used for his, his, he grew his own willow, his sally, um, coming, and the salax, coming from salax, um, uh, we get the word sally uh, garden, and um, so he would have grown his own, like many of the basket makers that we're talking about, um, including those from, from Leitrim. They'd have had their own supply, they'd have cut it back every year to get the straight um, rods every year, they might have allowed one or two or three years of growth depending on the thickness of the rods. So baskets are containers and they're used for storage and they're used for transporting and they have multiple uses. In the, in the museum we have uh, baskets that were used for storing eggs, we even have uh, straw made what you might call baskets which were actually uh, containers for clocking hens, um, bas laundry baskets, baskets for carrying and storing turf, um, baskets for on the bicycle, baskets in the cooking um, and, and straining potatoes, but also baskets for planting and uh, sowing uh, seeds and potatoes. Um, we have a very large basket that was used on the back of um, a, what's called a, a slide car, which is basically um, a cart without wheels that was used in Antrim. That's actually the biggest basket that we have on display. And among the smallest was uh, baskets that were made to cover the faces of little calves, um, known in Leitrim as gabons, um, to stop them from taking their mother's milk. It, it's a feast of baskets in, in, um, on display. But, uh, and including then, uh, very importantly, the baskets that uh, were carried on the back of animals. So there's two beautiful um, matching, a pair of baskets from, from Leitrim. Um, they were on the back of a, a donkey, or an ass as it's sometimes called, and uh, they were, there was, a, a, say, like a straw mat and a wooden, a wooden uh, piece from which the, the baskets would hang, and uh, they're wide at the top and very narrowing at the bottom. And these were particularly used in Leitrim, known in the South Leitrim area, particularly in areas where there wasn't good roads. A lot of the baskets on display are, are made from what people sometimes call wicker, made from the willow plants, um, and also um, the gardens of, of willow being called Sally Gardens. Um, but there's, there's also a lot of other materials, and some you, you mightn't actually know at first um, without careful looking. There's one example from Porta Cloy in Eris in County Mayo, and it's actually made from dock stems, um, which were cut and dried, but not too dry, before they were worked uh, into a, a very sturdy back basket. So um, anything that's pliable 
could be used to make a basket. There's two very important baskets, uh, both from County Leitrim that we have here. Uh, one was collected in the 1950s and one in 1958. I'll actually start with the one um, from 1958, which is um, the flatter of the two baskets. This basket was made by Jack Dignan from Drumbad in Clun, and he actually was a, a professional basket maker. Um, it's, it's very interesting. We're probably more familiar with um, the more rounded ones, but this is um, this this basket. We're told was actually of an older type that was um, more commonly used in South Leitrim. Um, we were very fortunate in the National Museum that um, the people who worked for the Irish Folk Folklore Commission that was set up in 1935 worked closely with the, the museum. And in this case, the collector in the Midlands area, James Delaney, was um, very prolific in his work, in his collecting, and also um, very generous in working with the museum. He was collecting from James Milton, and James Milton told James Delaney that this type of basket was actually the, the more common type of basket in the area. This basket was made in Uthra, County Leitrim, and made by James Kelleher. Um, he was a labourer, uh, not, not a professional basket maker, it's not how he made his living. Um, it's a very um, interesting basket with uh, a quite a stout uh, hoop or a bucky briar as it might sometimes be known and this this basket was collected in the 1950s um, and it was known as a teeming basket which um, is an interesting word it would be interesting to find the origin of but basically uh, its function was uh, straining potatoes Would you have heard of the term Bucky Briar? A Bucky Briar? Have you oh, Lord, I heard of Bucky Briar. That said, it eats the hands of you. It eats the hands of you. <laughs> the Bucky Briar now is a fairly heavy bit of timber. Yeah. Um, as I told you, I saw the Bucky Briar. I saw the children bringing it to the lake to fish. So I have the one long length of Bucky Briar, um, which I just work through my hands to, to get it a little bit more flexible and get a slight curve in it, and then bring it around into an oval shape. Now these baskets were made round as well, but for the purposes of this one we're going with oval. Um, I suspect that really the shape might have been determined just by the flexibility of the Bucky Briar that was been used at the particular time. Um, so the thick end of the Bucky Briar, I'm just using a knife just to thin it out a little bit, just so that the two ends meet. And then just using a piece of string, I am tying, um, tying a knot just to hold the oval shape of the frame in place and then I will attach it more securely using one willow rod. So I put the thick end of one willow rod against the basket and then start to twist the long length of the willow rod around itself and then around the, the meeting of the two, um, two ends of the bucky briar and then just sew in that final thin tip of the willow rod to hold it all together. And then a piece of string I bring across, or you can add in another piece of string just to tie one side of the, the hoop across to the other, just to 
to um, retain that nice oval shape until you start weaving. Okay, so that's our frame made. And you, you'd know team on the potatoes. You'd know the word team in. Yeah, yeah. Like in a lot oh, of areas, they're yeah. not familiar with that, the word team in. Yeah. We heard that from wherever to walk. Yeah. <laughs> So the three ribs or longitudinal rods are attached on one side of the basket. So we repeat that process now on the opposite side so that we create the depth that we want for the basket and attach these three rods to the hoop on the opposite side. So I start off with one willow rod. Um, it's well soaked, but I just soften it a little bit more on my knee because I just want a nice bit of flexibility in this first rod. So the thick end or the butt end of the rod, so to actually secure the rod itself, first of all, so I'm putting the butt end alongside the, the frame of the basket, bending it and really just wrapping this rod around itself to hold it in place. So this rod is well secured now. I'm just snipping off that tip of it. And now we start deciding on the depth that we want in the basket. So then taking each of these ribs to secure them one at a time, I'm using this long willow rod. So this is the depth of the basket. So then I do a crisscross to secure this first rib against the frame on the opposite side. Now I put my second rib, so you're eyeing them as well. And ideally that your, your middle rib is the strongest rod. So then a crisscross around the frame of the basket and around this middle rib and then our third rib. So just checking that the basket sits fairly evenly at this point. There will be room to, to adjust the, the ribs later on, but just that you're, you've established a fairly good shape to start off with. And then I'm just crisscrossing the final rib in. So the three ribs meet at either end and protrude just a little bit on either side. We can trim them off, even them off later, but just to make sure that they're protruding at opposite ends of the basket and they've been um, secured just with a crisscross, just using one a five foot rod. And then we start the weaving process just with the remainder of this rod. So around the frame and then an over and under weave. So alternating under one rib, over, around the frame, under, over, under, and around the frame. And when we get going, we'll be going around the frame twice each time. And then over and under. And I can just finish off this first rod, just push it through the weave and sew it off. Okay, so at this point now we have the frame of our basket secure. This thread just serves to, to hold the shape. And uh, Peter, have you any memories of like baskets or creels? Or oh, I, I remember creels, yeah. It was a neighbour of mine used to make creels. Where was he? What part of... What? Down in Glenanoff. All oh, right, okay. James McGuinness used to, used to make creeds. Yeah. 
Okay, so if we start the weave, we will weave a few rods on one side, then we'll work on the opposite side, and then we should be able to attach in our additional ribs. So starting off, doesn't matter which side you start on, so it's the butt end that I'm adding in. So I'm going to weave so that I'm always inserting the butt ends so that the butt end is out on the, on the bottom of the basket so that when the basket is finished there won't be any, um, any joins visible on the front of it. So it's an over and under pattern and starting off I'm weaving the rod twice around the frame each time and then over and under the ribs. So a lot of movement with the basket, you're bringing it whichever way is most comfortable just to get these initial rods in. And once you start doing that, you'll see how you start moving the ribs. So you're trying to just manage the ribs that they're evenly spaced as well. So an over and under. And when you get to the, the outer frame of the basket, you're going around it twice and then back to my over and under. And just all the time, just keeping an eye on the, the depth of the basket, just that your ribs are fairly, fairly well balanced on the bottom. Does anybody remember what the potato skins and the leftovers yeah. used to be called? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know. Used to be called Brock. Uh, oh, the Brock, that's yeah. right. The Brock. Yeah. 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 The Brock. Yeah. The Brock. Yeah. Yeah. The Brock. Yeah. The Brock. Yeah. Yeah. Leftover food, you know. And you used to call it Brock and you'd throw it out to the fowl or the turkeys or whatever you want. Thank you. The Brock, yeah. So depending on the size of the basket, for this basket here, I plan to add in about four rods, weave with four rods on either side. And at that stage, I will add in the extra, the two extra ribs to, to just create structure on the outer part of the basket. So again, finishing off with the tip end. Do you remember those gems? I do remember them. But they were, uh, some of the ones I seen were round. Round? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh, and used for team and potatoes. Yeah, get round and eat away. And eat from the basket. Yes, yes. Oh, when you'd have a plate and you'd have a plate, you know, and you'd take the potatoes as you want them out of it, you know. So when, the, like, the potatoes teamed outside, obviously, uh, yeah. and the basket brought in and put on the table. Yeah. Yeah, that should be done. Because I heard somewhere in, in South Leitrim that the potato basket used to be hung outside on the gable. Mm -hmm. And that if the basket wasn't hung on the gable, that if someone came to the house to know that the basket was in use, that the dinner was going on. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the signal mm -hmm. that it was dinner time. Mm -hmm. So you know you're right with your over and under weave if your pattern is alternating. So on top here, underneath at the next level and on top here. Again back to the frame. So we go around the frame twice just to ensure that the, um, the weave builds up evenly. And you're always pulling the rods as tight as you absolutely can. 
and I was pulling the rod in the direction that it's going. I wouldn't ever pull the rod back down the way, just tighten it in the direction that it's naturally going. Okay, so then to add in my next rod, so once the tip of the rod gets quite thin, we leave it again on the bottom of the basket. So always finishing off and starting the new rods on the bottom of the basket. So we insert the butt end. So in the exact same direction that the old rod was finishing off and continue on with the new rod. So these rods that I'm using have been harvested last year and left to dry. And then when I want to weave with them, they are soaked in water, depending on the type of willow and the length of the rod, they could be soaked in water for maybe five days up to nine days, just depending on the rod. So you know they're well soaked when, when they're basically, when you can work them in your hands, they're not really kinking. Um, and there's just a nice, nice flexibility with the rod. So in the past, um, fresh rods or green willow would have been used at times. Um, but the problem, I suppose, with using green willow is that it shrinks a lot. So as the sap dries out, the rod shrinks to about half to a third of its original size. So your basket will get very loose. But then the other side of that is that baskets then were replaced and made, it was, you know, replaced maybe annually. Um, so the, the skill was very much kept alive um, because as, as the basket got loose, more willow was just cut and new basket made. And for the most part, basket making was done um, in the winter time, kind of January, February, um, just before the, the spring activity took off again on the farm. So the, the repair jobs and, and that type of work were done in that quiet period of the year. So at this point, we have a nice piece of weave on either ends. And um, we have three ribs in. I'm gonna stop now and insert a further two ribs into the basket. So who made the creel? John and Pat, John Rooney from uh, Molly stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I've just held um, the extra ribs in the table just to create that curve in them. So again, same, same type of willow as we have here. So with these three ribs, I have two of thick ends and one thin end. So I'll do these in the, the opposite direction. So the thick end will be going to this side and the thin end up here. So to insert the extra two ribs, I'm really just um, with a point cut on either end of the rib, just inserting it in through the weave. So pushing it in as far as I can. So this rib has actually just gone, gone right up to the hoop here. And then this is largely where I, I want this rib to sit. So I'm going to cut it here and then just inserting it in through the weave on this side. When I was going to national school, the school was one big room with one fire at the end of it. And we'd be sitting down a long way from the fire, the teacher's table and the teacher's chair would be between us and the fire. And maybe as you got older at school, when you started being in, in the first class, first desk, the next year you'd be in the second desk, and by the time you'd be in third or fourth, you'd be gone down halfway through the school. And we used to be absolutely frozen in the winter time. And before we do our writing, we'd get up to the fire to warm our hands. But by the time we got back to our seats, our hands were as cold as ever again. And at lunchtime, 
We always had to take our lunch outside. In winter time? Yes, in winter time. And the lunch was usually homemade bread and a bottle of milk. Homemade bread, butter and homemade jam and a bottle of milk. And eat that outside and be colder still. But we had a great neighbour, Mrs McTiernan, and her son, Tommy, lived not two minutes' walk away from the school. And as soon as we had our lunches eaten, that was the first race up to McTiernan's to get warmed. And Mrs McTiernan would know we'd be coming. And she used to have on a big open fire. And beside the fire, she always had a basket of potatoes. She'd have her pot of potatoes boiled, and we often saw her bringing the pot outside the door and the basket out, and she'd drain her pot of potatoes into the basket and bring the basket, a big laughing flowery potatoes in and put them beside the fire. And that was for her dinner and her son's dinner. And what was left was for to feed the hens or the pig or whatever she had. And our way of warming our hands as well as at the fire was to lift one of our potatoes and roll it round in our hands to warm them. And very often we'd peel the potatoes with our fingers and eat a potato. And Mrs McTerran never said a cross word. And like we didn't realise then, but I know now that she probably wanted them potatoes to feed her animals, whatever they might be. But she never complained. And that was, it wasn't just once, it was every day. So were the potatoes fed to the hens? The potatoes were fed to the hens. And if there was a pig, fed to the pig. And there was always meal of some kind mixed through them potatoes. Sometimes she'd bruise the potatoes with her hands. And sometimes she'd use a pounder. And the pounder was made... It was just a long block of wood that she'd used to pound the potatoes. But to do that, she'd have to put them back in the pot. And most times, she used to just take them out of the basket and bruise them with her hands into a bucket or whatever she'd have. Um, and was the pot of potatoes very heavy for her to carry out off the fire? They were, of course. But... Nobody ever passed any remarks of that, just bring it with them and try and keep themselves safe and not get burned. And to drain the potatoes, in most country houses in them days, they used to be what was known as the pot cloth. And the pot cloth was made out of an Indian meal bag. So an oven glove? An o- well, an oven, yes, an oven glove is a much modern version. The pot cloth was made out of Indian meal bag in my young days. And she'd bring out her her potatoes, her pot, her basket and the the pot cloth. Now she would leave the lid on the potatoes, pull it sideways and just drain it out into the basket. And then when it was mostly drained, she'd take the lid off and the pot was lighter and she'd be able to empty the whole lot into the basket and let it drain for a minute or two outside on the street and bring it in then and put it beside the fire. And that was a daily occurrence. Always and ever, we brought out the potatoes to team them, winter and summer. Sometimes people ate potatoes maybe three times a day. My grandfather, my grandfather would eat a few potatoes before you go to bed. In these parts, the basket that I remember was round. Now, the bigger version of that was probably the one we had at home. And there's also a smaller version of it. But that size would be fairly standard, this particular size. There'd be one probably about four inches wider, a very wide one, that you would carry out in front of you. That's the one we used to bring in the turf from. But we also uh, had that one, and even a smaller one. That's the one we used to team the potatoes into. 
this basket size, where you'd have a metal mm. of people, that particular size would be left in the middle of the table with the potatoes on it, having been teamed. And they couldn't get to them half quick enough. As I said. Some of them would take a potato and they peel it with their thumb and just eat it whole. When you went out in the harvest time of year to pick potatoes in this or a bucket, you pick the big ones first, um, egg size up to that, and you left the porcines behind. In the now, ground? On the ground, or not, oh Jesus, not permanently, mm. I can assure you. This was the rottenest job of all times, having to go back to pick the porcines. Because at that stage, you'd have walked on them maybe, and they'd be small mm. anyway. So you'd have to put them down your finger on a cold October evening, <laughs> finding these little feckin' yolks. Um, the big ones were brought to the heap, the potato heap, and put into that uh, and covered. A trench to go around it and then the straw, or rushes actually were better than straw. Then when they were all heaped and dry, it had to be dry going in because if they weren't dry, they'd rot. So you had to have a good crispy October evening and the potatoes would be left to dry off and then covered. Now, they used to cover them with rushes, funny enough, not straw. The butchings weren't thrown out. They were put in a heap for themselves, and they were brought in then and cooked, boiled for the potato, for the hens or the pigs. Do you remember baskets, John James, been used to team the potatoes? Oh, I remember oh, them when. They were in every house. You know, every house. Okay, so we're just finishing off the basket now. The weave has essentially met in the middle. So you want it nice and tight. Just squeeze in as many rods as you possibly can. So that weave looks really tight. I'm happy with that. All my joins are on the back of the basket, so the back of the basket looks really messy, but we'll sort that out next. So inside of the basket, nice and smooth, no joins. So in terms of trimming off the basket, so I use garden secateurs. Um, when I have my garden secateurs, close it. When you close your secateurs, so there's a side with a ledge and there's a flat side. So I always put the flat side next to the willow because I'll get in closer and get it trimmed off um, closer to, to the actual basket. So my secateurs at an angle to the basket. I'm not going in at a, at a right angle. So coming from behind the rods, just lifting them ever so slightly and trimming them at an angle. So I'm just lifting the rods ever so slightly. And it's a good idea when you're trimming, particularly the, the butt end, the thick end of the rods, if you trim the rods so that they're actually resting against one of the ribs, and that way they can't push through the weave. Okay, and then finally, just to trim off these ribs, it's nice to leave a little bit of length in them. Just trim them off at an angle. And that's our potato teaming basket.